Yeah, there was this real sense in in reading this that, um, and he pointed this numerous times, how there's this, uh, because the Cold War is so thick with propaganda, um, digging through that and getting through the propaganda is his own task in and of itself, trying to really see the real conditions of what was happening, you know, um, during that that conflict between the United States and um the Soviet Union, the way it's often yeah. presented, the history of the Cold War is that the Soviet Union and the United States were like equal, that they were on this world yeah. stage and they were just this battle of, of you know, whether communism or capitalism or democracy or authoritarianism, what, what was going to win, you know? Right. But what you point to over and over again is that the United States was most, I mean, so obvious to everyone in the world. Maybe not to Americans. Including like Stalin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. not even Americans because they were so thick with ideology. <laughs> they couldn't necessarily see it. But everyone in the world knew that the United States was the superpower. The Soviet Union right. was Soviet there. Soviet Union knew it very well, yeah. 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 So, I mean, if you could speak to that reality where, um, you know, even Sukarno and other third world leaders knew that the United States was this extremely influential and powerful and violent nation state um right and yeah and just how they had to appeal they tried so much to appeal to the sensibilities and the patriotism and the history of the united right. states in order to say like hey we're like doing what you're doing you know um, exactly anyway if you could speak to that a bit yeah um yeah so as you said like the question is so you you mentioned briefly like oh yeah the cold war this uh this battle between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, but I think a lot of historians now, and not and not not radical historians, this is not like some some uh, far out uh, uh, reinterpretation. A lot of really um, some of the best historians of the Cold War are, are, are starting to say, well, was the was it really a conflict between Washington and Moscow, or was it a conflict between the first and the third world? With the third world losing very badly. I mean, to the extent that the Soviet Union did things in the Cold War, and they did. Yeah, um, it there was there was not really like uh, there was no push to take over the world, right? There was there was not a push to sort of unleash terror uh, on the streets of the United States. There were these moments where oh, in Cuba, um, accidentally, I mean, they had they didn't expect or really want uh, Fidel to turn. I mean, they, Fidel was not expected to 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 turn communist and and ask for military assistance. You know, th those are the flashpoints where the Soviet Union is kind of almost like, oh, you know, because they knew. And, I mean, you know, and this is not because the, the leaders of the Soviet Union were nice, nice guys. I mean, even Stalin, um, who was clearly, clearly br brutal and murderous and cynical whenever he felt that that was the best way to act, recognized that it's not best to provoke the United States. He he was completely destroyed uh, or his his country was completely destroyed by World War Two. He thought through um as a result of his own sort of dogmatic Marxism-Leninism or his own interpretation of it, he thought that the West, the, the First World, would destroy itself in like an intra-imperialist war. So he thought that the imperialist countries would go to war with themselves again and that the Soviet Union could just kind of wait and like, you know, get better at science and agriculture and then history would be handed to them, right? Mm -hmm. And as you rightly point out, in the Third World, even leaders that were very cynical uh, about the United States, even leaders that were outwardly communist. So, for example, Ho Chi Minh. When Ho Chi Minh um, declared independence from France in 1945, the speech started, all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. End quote. So, like, he he's saying this not only because he actually believes in the same ideals. He's also hoping that the United States doesn't pick a fight with him because he doesn't want to go to he doesn't want to be in a war with the United States, the most powerful military and economic power that's ever existed. Right. So he's he's making the case to them, I think, in good faith. Like, look, man, the France, the French dominated us for hundreds of years. We just want independence. Like, don't don't punish me just because I'm. Uh, a leftist, and by the way, he became a leftist um, in the years that he was repeatedly disappointed by the League of Nations uh, uh, a failure to take a stand on on colonialism. But then Sukarno, again, same thing, 1955, 
Bon Doom Conference, uh, they they organize this the or the this um, meeting of the the peoples of the third world. And as he says, sort of very very insp- inspirationally, you, you can watch the speech on YouTube saying. Uh, this is the first time in the history of humanity that color peoples have gotten together without white white people overseeing us. And, and but even even though it was kind of an implicit threat to the United States, this rise of the third world, they found some date in the calendar that was that corresponded to the American Revolution, which happened to be the the night of Paul Revere's ride. And, and, they, and they mentioned this very loudly. They said, "Look, look, look." We are following in the spirit of the American Revolution. And, you know, <laughs> again, what they were doing, what they were doing is being like, come on, like, just don't like, let us let us be. Don't crush us, right, you know, right. because everybody, everybody with half a brain in 1955 or 1945 or understood that the United States is by far the most powerful nation on Earth. Again, Fidel Castro, a very <laughs> hard headed, uh, 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 single minded leader of a marxist leninist state in 1970 as salvador allende takes over fidel castro tells allende hey 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 don't don't provoke the gringos like don't i'm not i'm not coming to your inauguration don't pick a fight with them <laughs> because what everybody understood and everywhere in the world that was not the united states is that the, the u.s was a uh was a uh a, a trigger happy um if not uh, aggressively ideological power that if you if 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 you got in their sights they would probably throw a lot of resources to crush you and um you know very tragically this is what happened and, and my book happens to be about one tactic that is employed um in this in the second half of the 20th century just not because i found it the most interesting or just it was just a story that i stumbled onto and i moved to indonesia and it's just the use of of the intentional mass murder of leftists and 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 as i point out in the book and i found that in at least 20 nations the united states uh allies of the united states carried out the intentional mass murder of of leftists and and of course indonesia 1965 was the worst was the worst case um with the uh the death of approximately one million innocent civilians but and this was something that was, there's this tragic conversation that i think you probably noticed in the book but this back and forth between certain sectors of the left and the center right like well can we can we construct this sort of mild social democracy uh we'll, we'll, if we play by the rules will we get away with it or do we have to be militant and self-defensive and ready for the inevitable return of the white people. Well, are the white people going to come back and try to crush us? Or if we do what they, if we do things according to the way that they say they believe things should be done, if we act according to their self-professed beliefs, will we be fine? And very, very tragically, I mean, this is one of the hardest parts of the book for me to, to grapple with, uh, it was the people that believed in the self-professed ideals of the United States that ended up crushed or, or worse.